Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy and what an exciting time we live in. Because yesterday when I was working in the Upper Peninsula, Sir Richard Branson and his crew from Virgin Galactic rocketed into space. I was fortunate enough to be able to watch it live before I started work. It was a similar feeling to what I had when they won the X Prize more than a decade ago. Let's take a few minutes and go over the flight and then maybe answer some questions about it. So let's cue up the music and get going. Now, for those of you that have been living under a rock for the last few months, let me go ahead and go over what actually happened yesterday. This was a suborbital flight. The spaceship, which is here slung under the mothership Eve, was taken up to approximately 50,000 feet. Now, once released, it fired its rocket engines. As it hit Mach 1, the speed of sound, it began to pitch up to a near vertical attitude. And it continued in that attitude until its rocket engine ran out of fuel approximately 60 seconds after it was fired. Once the rocket engine cut out, everybody in the capsule was weightless. It continued to coast up, slowing down as gravity pulled it back until it hit apogee. Now apogee for this flight was about 53 miles or 85 kilometers. It then pitched over and began its descent back to Earth. Now at this time it was an unpowered aircraft, essentially a glider. It began to do some spirals to lose altitude and speed. And then as it approached the airport in Truth or Consequences, New Mexico, it began to do some S-turns to bleed off speed and altitude again, and then came in for a landing. This is very similar to what the NASA test plane, the X-15, did in the early 1960s. The difference between Virgin Galactic and the X-15 was X-15 was a NASA project. Virgin Galactic is private enterprise for paying passengers, albeit very rich ones, but these are private individuals willing to show out a quarter of a million dollars for 15 minutes in space. Now I'm gonna go ahead and make myself a little smaller here and put on my headset, and we're gonna go through this flight real quick. Five, three, two, one, release, release, release. Fire. All right, that was at about 46,000 feet. It's firing the rocket engine. It'll accelerate up to Mach 1, pretty much in level flight, and then it's going to start to pitch up. You're seeing it start to pitch up now. Here's a side view. Notice that the curve of the Earth is rather subdued at this altitude. They're starting to get up, but you see now they're what they're doing is they're bringing the feather. Okay, let's take a second and go over what just happened. It went quickly, so let's go ahead and bring up that illustration again. The spacecraft was released from the mothership Eve. It accelerated in level flight to approximately Mach 1. Then it began to pitch up. Now as it was coming up, as soon as the rocket engine burned out, everyone in the spacecraft was weightless and the pilots cleared the passengers to unstrap. Now these booms that are on the back are hinged up and what they do is they come up to help increase drag. But at this time, everybody in the spacecraft is weightless because they're no longer under powered flight, the engines have cut off and they're coasting upward towards apogee. So let's go ahead and rejoin them. Welcome to space. Welcome to space indeed. To all you kids down there, I was once a child with a dream, looking up to the stars. Now I'm an adult in a spaceship with lots of other wonderful adults looking down to our beautiful, beautiful Earth. To the next generation of dreamers, if we can do this, just imagine what you can do. Now I want to take a moment and just thank Sir Richard Branson for those words of inspiration. In addition to expanding the science of aerospace now, now Richard Branson talked about how the Apollo 11 moon landings inspired him 
to go into this line of work. So many people say that this is a thrill ride for billionaires, and while that may in many ways be true, hopefully it will also serve as a source of inspiration for future generations of aerospace engineers. Branson, who's 70 years old, is getting ready to go weightless. I do want to make note of this young lady right here in the center. And I want to just make note of her typical NASA astronaut hairdo. This is something that happens to long hair when you're weightless. But let's go ahead and continue the adventure. All right, everybody, Whoa. look out the window. Don't miss Epigees. Oh, my it God. Will be quiet. Incredible. Woo! <laughs> oh, my God. What an amazing experience they had. This is unbelievable. This is too unbelievable. Uh. You know, I'll tell you something. I'd like to take a moment. For those people that say that those folks are on wires in front of a green screen, you know, everything from the attaching cords for the earplugs to the seat belts to all the different people moving back and forth in a rather confined space. I'd really like to know how you'd rig those wires. Now, another thing that I want to point out too, is when we looked at the rocket, when it first started off, you saw the curve of the Earth in the background, but it was very subtle. This is the same view. Notice how much more the Earth is curved here. And even though this goes diagonally across the screen, there's definitely a crescent shape to the entire thing. So this isn't a lens effect. That's actual curvature of the Earth. And by the way, See how bright the Earth is? I don't see any stars, do you? I also notice as the Earth rotates around, as the spacecraft rotates, the curve isn't changing. That's another sign that this is not a fish-eyed lens. Amazing. What a shot of the sun there. Those guys are having the time of their lives. Your seats and strap in. Approach and re-entry. Okay, let's go over what's happening now. So we had release at 46, 47,000 feet. We had a 60 second burn. We came up to Apogee as a glider. Now remember, they became weightless about right here as soon as the engine cut out. They came over the top. Now they're coming down. These booms are extended out to kind of slow the uh, craft down as it re-enters. But as it starts to level off down in here, you're going to start feeling the effect of gravity again. So where we are right now is right up in this area. The uh, spaceship is going to be re-entering and feeling the effects of gravity shortly. So the pilots are getting all the passengers back into their seats. Now while we've got this screen up, let's go ahead and talk briefly about what space is and where it starts. There are no hard and fast rules about where space starts. Now, the United States Air Force and the FAA, they consider space to begin at 50 miles above sea level, and anybody that flies above that level gets astronaut wings. Now, why 50 miles? Because at 50 miles above the surface, the aircraft flight surfaces are no longer effective. Now, one of the things that you'll notice on some of the videos from this flight is the pilots talked about activating the reactive control system. These are a series of jets that take the place of the ailerons and the elevators and everything. That's how they control the pitch of the spacecraft when there's no air up there for the control surfaces to work with. Now another way to determine the border of the atmosphere and space is something called the Kármán line. Now a lot of people have heard of that but they don't really know what it means. Let me explain it to you. As an aircraft flies through the air air comes over the wings and generates lift. In order to generate enough lift to maintain controlled flight, you have to go a certain velocity. As the air thins out, that velocity increases. So the higher you get, the faster you have to go in order to maintain controlled flight and generate enough lift to support the weight of the aircraft. Now the Kármán line is defined as the altitude at which the velocity needed to maintain lift over the wings equals orbital velocity or 17,500 miles an hour. 
Now that is located at approximately 85 kilometers above the surface. Now that brings us to the final determination of what is the cutoff of space. And that is 100 kilometers or 62 miles, and that is what the Kármán line is kind of defined as internationally. That's a legal definition. Now, the reason that it's a legal definition has to do with something called national sovereignty. Now, in the olden days, if you were standing on the beach of your country and you saw a foreign warship off the coast, they're a little too close for comfort. They are literally in your coastal waters. And as a result, the sovereignty of a nation was considered four miles off their shores. So if a foreign ship came into that zone without permission, you could chase them off. The other thing that we had too is the coastal weapons of the time couldn't reach out more than two or three miles. So again, that was an area of your coastal seas that you could control. Now as aircraft were developed, the same principle applied. If you flew over somebody else's territory and they could reach you, you were in their control. So when it comes to space, there's a couple of things that you have to look at. First of all, how far up do you actually control? Second of all, how far up can you project power? So when the Soviets put up Sputnik, we had to somehow deal with this. Now, we had been talking about it for a while, but when the satellite actually went up, it kind of forced the issue. Uh, we couldn't really shoot it down, A, because we didn't have the technology, and B, that would have been a very hostile action, and it could have had significant international repercussions. So as a result, we decided that the line was going to be 100 kilometers above sea level. Anything below that was in the atmosphere and in national territory. Anything above it was in space and it was in international territory. It was a freedom of navigation issue. Notice too, the pilots are wearing oxygen. The passengers are not because it's a pressurized cab and the pilots, you've got to make sure they're conscious. The passengers, not so much. Now this is a camera off of the port fin in the back of the um, spacecraft. You can see we're still in the burn on the way up. If you look behind my head, you'll see the curved surface of the Earth, but due to the angle, that thing's going almost straight up. And it's on its way up to apogee. It's still on its burn. Now this spacecraft got up to a little bit more than Mach 3. That is not enough to get into orbit around the Earth. You need to get up to about Mach 26 or 27. So it simply wasn't going fast enough to go into orbit. It was going to it was going to go up and then it was going to come down. Now, the other question a lot of people might have is why isn't there the big flames that you see on the re-entry of spaceships? Well, again, that's a function of the speed. You start off in orbit at about Mach 27 and then as you come down into the thinner air, your speed generates friction, which is that flame and the heat that comes out, and that's part of what slows you down, is that friction of the thicker atmosphere. You don't have that problem with Virgin Galactic. Now, it did heat up a little bit because it was going Mach 3, and there is friction at that speed. Even on the way back down, it hit Mach 2. But it's not going to generate that sort of flame. Notice, too, that the spacecraft, although very strongly constructed, is a lot more delicate looking than just a blunt capsule, which is basically like dropping a bullet. Now, one thing that Sir Richard Branson did announce upon his return is that they are donating two tickets to a charity to be raffled off or put into a drawing of some sort. Uh, to be honest with you, I'm gonna put in for him because quite frankly, I don't have a quarter of a million dollars sitting around for a ticket and that would be the only way I could ever get a ride on this thing. And to be honest with you, I'd love to have one. And now I'll research that a little bit. And if there's a link to it, I'll put it in the description of this video in the next couple of days. Go ahead and sign up for a chance. What's it going to hurt? So this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you very much for stopping by and being part of this extraordinary experience with me. Take care, and we'll see you again soon.
soul. 